All right. Hello, everyone. So welcome uh, again to another episode of The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. All right. So as always, hosting today's session are Don, Sim, and me, Yunir. Right, so the, today's episode is rather a special one. We are going to talk about Islam. And we are privileged to have with us a special guest, uh, Dr. Noor Azlina Zakaria, and, uh, and also another guest, Nick. So doctor, welcome and thank you for joining us. Right. Thank you. Uh, so, all right, so, so for today's talk, it's mainly going to be a Q&A session. So perhaps we can each take turns to ask uh, a couple of questions for the doctor to respond to. Are we okay with that? Yes, that's good. Okay. All right. Okay, so if we are okay, then can I first invite doctor uh, to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about yourself, where you are uh, staying currently and what you do professionally? All right. Uh, my name is uh, Nora Zina Zakaria. Okay, uh, I'm uh, from uh, Kedah, and I'm I'm now staying at Jitra Kedah, North uh, Peninsula Malaysia. Uh, I was uh, a lecturer at uh, University Islam Antarabangsa Sultan Abdul Halim Azam Shah, or the acronym is UNISHAMS, and was known as Insania. Uh, and now, uh, since last two years, I have been uh, I've been uh, working at uh, a new University, University Utara Malaysia at Sinto, just near my hometown. Right. And when I was at UNISHAM, um, I was uh, teaching comparative religion, Islamic theology, Islamic philosophy, and also counseling Islamic perspective. Uh, and after I did my PhD, uh, uh, writing about comparative between Islamic counseling and uh, Christian counseling, so um, I've been uh, offered to teach at uh, University Utara Malaysia, Islamic counselling at that university. And so uh, now as if I'm changing my, uh, and my, uh, what, uh, my, um, what we call it, uh, focus in my teaching and uh, changing from Islamic uh, philosophy to uh, Islamic counselling. And I'm now, uh, still pursuing my master in counseling at UC Science Malaysia. I'm now in the fifth semester, uh, doing practicum already. All right. So currently in UUM, I'm teaching research methodology and also uh, Islamic counseling in UUM. Uh, and my degree, first degree, second degree, and my PhD uh, was in Islamic philosophy. And I did uh, my master thesis about Buddhism in Malaysia. Uh, focusing on mysticism, comparison between mysticism in Buddhism and Islam. And my PhD thesis is a comparative study uh, on Islamic counseling and Christian counseling. Okay, that is some brief uh, background uh, about myself. Okay, thank you so much for the... Okay. All right, thank you so much for the introduction. All right, so uh, maybe I'll start with the first question uh, for Dr. Right. So, Doctor, uh, so can we, can we, I think we start with the fundamentals, right? So, what exactly is Islam and who is can be considered as a Muslim? All right. Uh, basically, a Muslim is um, any human being, yeah, uh, who announced that Allah is the God, the only God, and Prophet Muhammad is his messenger. So uh, when we declare it with uh, by sayings, ashhadu ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Okay, meaning is that uh, 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 you believe that Allah is the only God and uh, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and that belief is not just by your saying, but your heart also accept it, uh, accept that faith. Yeah. Uh, to, uh, with a strong faith, strong belief, then uh, then after that announcement, you are already a Muslim. After that belief and announcement, you are considered a Muslim and you have to believe six uh, other fundamentals 
uh, in Islam there is uh, that Allah is the only God and there are messengers of God and Muhammad is one of them. Right, there are many messengers, and there are 25 messengers' names that it, that had been pronounced in Al Quran, the book. And then you have to believe about revelation, and uh, this revelation consists of a revelation that is not written, and the written one is called Al Kitab. Kitab, and there are four. Uh, kitab that had been mentioned in Al Quran that is um, uh, in, uh, Zabur, Taurat, Injil, and Al Quran. Okay, in Arabic. Then the third one you you have to believe the the existence of angels. Okay, that is made with light, and you cannot see it with your. Uh, the, the, the human vision and then you have to believe that there will be uh, the end of the world that we call as Kiyama and after that there will be another world that is called uh, Yawmul Akhirah or Hereafter and um, the sixth one the sixth thing that you have to believe about uh, destiny that is had been made by uh, God and everything that happened is uh, written in the destiny that had been assigned by God. So that is what we call as pillars of Islam. Six, six basic beliefs that you have to believe initially, uh, uh, plus your testimony that Allah is the only God and Muhammad is Rasulullah. With that six belief, then you are uh, called a Muslim. All right. So the thing is that this belief and announcement. So both you need to both believe and announcement by reciting the shahada. We call that shahada. Yeah. Okay. Is it clear, Yunir? Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for that. So, uh, so you talked a, a bit, or, or rather, uh, focused a lot on the belief, right? And then, of course, the announcement. Uh, but I think to to many outsiders, right? To many non-Muslims, and even maybe perhaps to Muslims themselves. Uh, the understanding when you talk about Islam, first come, first thing that may come to mind is are the laws, right? Are the strict laws? You know, Islam is a strict religion and things like that. So the belief isn't at the at the at the front, right? As opposed to what you were sharing just now. So on that note, right? Regarding laws, maybe can I invite uh, Sim to ask maybe a question or two regarding the laws that you may have in mind? Yeah, sure. So um, maybe, Doctor, you can just tell us a bit about Sharia and what it means to you. Sharia um, literally means law. Sharia in Arabic means law. Okay, and it is what had been ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and written clearly in the Quran. So every law is written in the revelation in the Quran and the Quran is the revelation that had been revealed through uh, Gabriel, the angels, to Muhammad, uh, the prophet, okay, and had been uh, recited and written on the day the revelation had been revealed by Gabriel, by his companions, because Muhammad is a person, is an uh, illiterate who cannot write. So after the, re the revelation, he will recite it in front of a few companions that will, will write it, yeah, uh, uh, on, on leaves, yeah, on animal skins, yeah, on those days, we don't have papers yet. All right, and then, so all this, uh, the re revelation consists of advice, just purely a, a advice about life, okay, and faith telling what, who you are as human being, where you could you be, what you should do as a Muslim, what is Muslim, what is non-Muslim, and then stories about um, uh, last prophets, um, we call it as um, followers, okay, ummah or followers, about all the stories since Adam until uh, the uh, prophet before Muhammad, that is Jesus or Isa alayhi salam, the stories about their followers and what happened in those days. All right. And then the, the fourth thing that uh, is written in a Quran is the law. The law that to be abided by Muslim. Yeah. Okay. It consists uh, uh, of first one is. 
uh, rituals like uh, uh, worship, worships, yeah, what you do to submit yourself to God as a ritual and worship. That is five things. Yeah, the first one reciting the shahada testimony that I told you is uh, to be Muslim. Second one is to to perform uh, salah or pray uh, a prayer, the compulsory prayer five times a day. Okay, to perform. Um, fasting in the month of Ramadan, the whole month, yeah, and then to perform Hajj, yeah, if you have the ability to do so, and lastly, to pay for the Zakah, yeah, Zakah is the, uh, the, the compulsory uh, charity when your wealth, uh, 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 what uh, reach yeah the sum of money that you have to donate them if we call that a compulsory donate donation or zakah okay and then it is also told other sharia that it, that is the five compulsory things to be abided by muslim all right and then there are also that is the sharia or, uh, related to worship or rituals yeah okay and it's also told that you can do the uh, not a compulsory, but if you want to do the, the non-compulsory uh, rituals, it is also mentioned about those that you can do it uh, voluntarily, right? Then the second uh, part of the law is about um, how to, uh, this, this, these five things we call ibadah, the law of ibadah, worshipping, okay, and submission. Okay, the second uh, component of law is what we call as mu'amalah. Mu'amalah is related to how a human being should deal uh, with the uh, society and the economic well-being, economic. So what, what, uh, what you, you should do for your... Uh, to work, what you should do to gain your food, what you should, what is the business that you can do, what is the transaction that is uh, permitted to do, what are the transaction is prohibited by God, yeah, and uh, also uh, about uh, education, yeah, about uh, governing society, that uh, all these laws is called mu'amala. And the third component of law is called munakahat, uh, laws related to marriage and family well-being. Okay, how to pick uh, a good spouse, still beginning at picking, choosing what is the type of spouse uh, or woman or man to be chosen as a wife and husband, then how to do engagement, all the rituals about engagement, and then how to get married, what to say when you are marrying, all right, after marrying, what should the husband do, what is the obligatory uh, of a husband, and what is the obligatory of the wife, yeah? Uh, and sorry, then doctor. What, yes? sorry. Yeah, so I think um, I would sort of maybe stick on this point about the marriage laws for a while and maybe ask you some questions since we're... Can I finish the fifth, the fifth part so you go, won't get confused? Sure, sure. Okay, after the marriage law and then there is the fifth law is about governance and political law. So the government, the governance law is about who are who are the uh, what uh, leader that you should pick, what kind of leader you should or shouldn't pick, and then what are gov the governance that you should run. And then in that, uh, the fifth section of the law is about what are the, uh, the compulsory rulings, what are the crime that you have to use, what is prescribed in the Quran to uh, do judgment, what are the crime that you can leave it to the uh, judges that you appointed to rule. All right. So this is what we call jinayat. Yeah? Uh, the laws uh, related to jinayat is uh, crime and also governance. All right. So there are that the uh, Islamic laws can be divided into five sections and everything is mentioned in the Quran. Okay. Okay. Right. Please, Yunir, can you continue? All right. So uh, in regards to marriage, right, um, yeah. I see that they for women especially they would have to have like their guardians consent um to the court mm -hmm. or um to get married whereas men they don't um really have to um, abide by such rules they they can just 
choose and pick whoever they want to marry. Why why is there such a difference between guys and girls? Okay, uh, it is because of it's not just marriage uh, law, it is the family law. Uh, when every uh, daughters, okay, uh, we call their guide their guardian is the father, and if the father died, then the, the Quran mentioned about the steps of guardian. After the if the father died, then the grandfather. If the grandfather died, then the uh, uncles, and then the brothers uh, will be the all the daughters guardian or the uh, girl siblings guardian. So every woman will uh, entitled to a guardian in their life after, uh, before they get married. After they get married, the guardian will they, they are, what we call that guardian will be the husband. So the meaning of guardian is not just you uh, you have to get permission to do this and to do that. The meaning of guardian also is the one who are going to take care of you, protect you, and also um, what uh, give uh, 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 you the living means uh, uh, what provide food, provide houses, provide clothing, provide education, and so forth. It is the responsibility of this guardian. So because Islam put all this guardian, whereas man, the uh, the what the son, yeah, a man after. He, he reached the, his puberty period. Okay, men also have puberty period okay, in Islam. Then he is his own. He has to find his own living. He has to work. Whereas the woman is not uh, compulsory to work to find uh, her own living. Whereas a man or the son in the family is compulsory to find his own living after his puberty age. That's why he has the uh, more um, freedom compared to the girls that is depending, should actually depend, depending to the, all the men in the family as her guardian. All right. So that's why in Islam, because, uh, because of the de de dependency, Okay, then if that girl is going to get married to somebody, of course, uh, uh, she need to get permission from her guardian. It's not just the father. All right, but there is some, um, uh, we have denomination also, we call it mazhab in Islam. One of the mazhab is Hanafi that said that as if the girl choose a right person, a, a pious person, responsibility, okay, she did not. Uh, have to have the permission of the guardian, all right? So it is not like absolute, absolute right. Okay, and in other, like us in uh, Ma uh, Malaysia or Singapore, we used to follow the Shafi'i denomination. Even in Shafi'i de de denomination, even though the permission should be uh, got from the guardian, it's not absolute. If the guardian forced the lady or the daughter to get married with somebody that is not good, then the uh, the what the court the sharia court can take the ruling from the guardian to marry that daughter for example i am a daughter my father want me to marry with somebody is not good in behavior and in religion hmm. i want to challenge my father i can go to the court and i can get permission so i will get married with uh, the, the one who will be my wali or guardian had been changed from my father to the court to the uh, judge mm. so it's not absolute the lady have some what we call holes yeah. to get over if the guardian's ruling is not fair mm. I see. Right. Okay. okay okay um i see also some sharia courts in bahrain uh, iraq jordan libya morocco syria and tunisia so i'm not sure what uh, the denominations they are in but in some cases they actually allow for example, in instances of rape, uh, the rapist can escape punishment by marrying his victim. Um, and also sometimes the victim who complains to the court is also prosecuted with zina or adultery if they, if they expose themselves to be raped and they're already married. Um, do you agree that women who are raped should marry their rapists or should be punished um, by speaking up? Or what, what are your thoughts on these kind of procedures? In Islam, actually, you should differentiate um, uh, what is the meaning of rape. Rape, okay. In the common law 
or the civil law, even in Malaysia, okay, if a, a, a girl or a boy, a boy, yeah, do some sexual intercourse, they uh, freely, freedomly, nobody force, okay. If uh, the age of that girl or the boy is under 18, it is considered a rape. Even though they did it freely, they love each other and did commit what we call zina or uh, adultery. Uh, they are considered uh, the the boy is considered doing rape eh, to the girl. So that's why first and foremost we need to define what is rape. Yeah, all right. If it is truly a rape, in that case, that is not considered rape in Islam. Yeah, it might be considered rape because the in Islamic law, uh, the charge. The full, uh, the what we call um, children. <laughs> the age of children is af- is below puberty. After yeah. puberty, then the in Islam, the girl is a woman and that boy is a man, not a children anymore. So mm-hmm. the definition of age uh, is different in Islamic law and also in the civil law. All right. So in Islam, if both of this girl and boy commit adultery, okay, they love each other or freely without any forces, after the age of puberty, then it's not considered rape anymore. It's considered zina or adultery. So in that cases, um, uh, if it is, uh, okay, in Islam, if nobody caught them, nobody caught uh, both who commit adultery, then nobody, they are not going to be punished. Okay, so if somebody caught them with witnesses or they openly announce, go to the court and surrender themselves, then only they, the case will go on. Okay, nobody are going to court somebody without any witness or proof, right? Nobody could be caught without witness and proof. Okay, in the case of rape, what is the meaning of rape in Islam? That is a boy or a man, you commit a sexual intercourse to a girl or woman without her consent uh, that is called rape and in islam the one who the one who is uh, doing rape will be punished yeah um if that the, the, the man had uh, is married so the punishment is death stoning yeah well the girl will be uh, not punished uh, will not be punishing so if the man is stoned, then how could he marry that girl? He will be died. He will be dead. If the man is not a married man, then he will be beaten hundred times. Yeah. All right. So is is it the girl should be forced by the family to marry that man? If that man is a bad man, so it is not allowed for. The, the the girl to marry that man and could not be forced by the family unless that girl is uh, freely agree to get married with that man. Okay, sometimes rape rape is not just rape. Yeah, you know, sometimes they love each other and accidental rape happens. Yeah. So uh, if the rape the family could not force the raper to get married with the girl because like I told you. Uh, a, a family can only force a girl to get married if the man is pious, uh, is pious, good behavior, yeah, Islamically uh, a deal with Islamic teaching and all this. If not, that raper is called bad, is considered bad man. Then the family could not force that girl to get married. So the judge won't allow mm. unless the girl herself is freely or because of love would like to marry that raper. Okay. After being beaten hundred times, and after being, uh, what we call tauba means repent. After he repent and be punished by by what we call it rotan, uh, or beaten for hundred times. Yeah, for a man who is not married yet, for a man who had married and raped uh, that woman, definitely the the what the punishment is death by stoning. So no issue of marrying that raper. Alright, so that is actually what is stated in the Quran and Islamic law and understood by most of the Muslim. Whereas what happened in courts might be, you know, courts, lawyers, play, uh, playing words, it happens also even in Sharia courts. Mm, I see. Okay. Mm. Okay. So doctor, maybe I'll, I'll take this chance to uh, maybe ask, 
right so just now you're talking about the sharia right you, you were explaining yeah. to us the ruling based on the sharia right based on what the quran is saying so yes. but nonetheless you know uh you know we 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 do hear occasionally i guess of cases where uh the the victim of a rape do get forced to marry uh the the rapist right uh, the the mm-hmm. criminal so and then the argument is hey this is based on sharia so is it re- so from what you are saying it's not really sharia then there may yes. be other other things at play other influences could it be culture or yeah it might be culture and because of the knowledge of that girl herself and uh, that's why it's advocacy to muslim women must must be done sometimes they 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 they, they don't know that uh, many women when i did all the advocacies with the muslim women about your right uh, uh, and consent to get married and you can deny your guardian will to marry with somebody else somebody uh, heard that as new things but it's clearly stated in the sharia book if we learn since actually it is stated in uh, SPM syllabus so I don't know why the teacher did not teach it properly so uh, these girls might maybe forget about this ruling and um, uh, the guardian might take advantage because the girls did not really alert with that uh, their rights in in these terms. But it is stated clearly in the enactment. You know, it's, it's stated clearly in the all the what we call it enactment uh, enactment undang-undang keluarga negeri uh, Malaysia. We have that enactment, right? It is stated mm. clearly about uh, that the guardian cannot force a girl to marry a bad guy non-pious, Islam is teaching, it is clearly set in the enactment. So if the girl did not know how to challenge, or sometime, you know, you know, um, in Malaysian culture, okay, sometimes they just surrender to what the will of the father, uh, feeling mm. helpless, helpless, okay, or they know they're right, but they want to, don't want to right. lose ties with the family and they just surrender like that. Uh, that is what it should actually happen. It's not that it is permitted by law, but all the culture, uh, family culture in Malaysia, uh, uh, Malaysia is better than Arabic country actually. Uh, so in okay, Arabic country, of course, <laughs> it's a more patriarchal society, I guess. Yeah, yeah it's okay. That- hmm. Okay, so maybe uh, see any more questions? If not, maybe we can ask Don. All right. Yeah. Um. Just last one before we move on to the other panel member. Um. What about I guess certain scriptures that talk about domestic violence against women, where they say that um, it is okay to hit a girl as long as um, uh, the for example, I think um one of the verses was saying about how um as long as the the um. The item or, or or what 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 you hit them with is is thinner or smaller than 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 a stick of a tree, for example, or that um as long as um you feel that your partner is is cheating or is being disobedient, it is okay to hit them as long as you don't leave any marks on their bodies and things like that. Do you, do you, do you feel that that is a um a quote that people always like to misrepresent or? Do you feel that uh that there's actually some explanation as to why that the scripture was written that way? All right, okay. It is clearly stated in the Quran. Clearly, it's in the Quran and not in the prophet tradition or in the hadith. It's clearly stated in the Quran about a disobedient wife. After all, telling about marriage, yeah, the how uh, husband responsibility, wife responsibility, then it comes the verse in the Quran about. It's not cheating. It's it's a it's about the disobedience of a wife. Okay, so it's stated that if, uh, your wife is not uh, obedient yeah, to you, then the first step is you give advice. Okay, there are steps. You know, <laughs> it's not beating at last. You give advice, good advice. Okay, second, you you do not sleep with that your partner you living psycho you mean uh, like a psychology uh, remark yeah to say that okay i am not agree with you nowadays it's not that the man leave the the man leave the woman the woman we usher the man away and shut the door <laughs> All right but in the grand said that you leave your wife and do not sleep with with her so that 
she can feel that uh, you are serious okay and then the third what the third step then if that she did still uh what stubborn and uh, did not obey you then you can beat her and then while explaining about this verse in the quran so uh Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam have a tradition hadith while explaining this word. She said that the beating must not hurt. The beating is actually a psychological punishment, and he showed uh, how she, he uh, he took a cloth and make a what a knot at the end of the cloth and swing it to the wife. So he showed the companion about this is a way of beating with a cloth that have knot. Yeah. At the end of it, it is a psychological action and it's not physical violence. It's, it is to show the seriousness. And at the end of the verse, it say that uh, uh, if, okay, you, the marriage, okay, because the disobedience can uh, come out to problem in marriage. If the marriage is could not be uh, harmony anymore, then the fourth step is us, yeah. Uh, a representative from you, a man, and the representative from the girl, from the wife, to uh, advise them and to what to be uh, a moderator, yeah, to 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 uh, get them together and be harmonious again. Then the fifth step, if all the step that you did, yeah, did not um, uh, give any reason result then the option is divorce yeah and it say that please divorce the woman okay uh uh bil ihsan with a very good manner as uh, just as the same as you took her into marriage then release her okay with all the grace yeah as as just the same as when you took her uh, as a wife yeah uh, during marriage so all these six steps have been mentioned and it is actually describing about the crisis in the family and the way to solve the crisis and the last one is divorce all right so it is understood by everybody from that teaching and for example i myself since i'm in school okay when the verse come and of of course the ustad and ustaza will explain the same thing that i have explained that beating the wife is not a torture and not a uh, a physical violence it's a psychological signature or sig signal uh, to the wife that what you did is serious okay and every muslim know that it, uh, every muslim who who read the quran know that that is punishment is permitted and what kind of beating is permitted so when the, the if there is violence okay, domestic violence beating so the wife will always know a muslim wife who read quran and know the hadith will always know that is not permitted by the prophet and islam and okay. the, the, the man also who read the Quran the, the problem is the Muslim didn't read the Quran and just heard those saying and don't understand what is actually uh, taught by the Prophet Prophet Muhammad mm, because I see in the Middle East there's a lot of um, domestic violence and even actually in Singapore it's actually quite bad but the, it's a quite a silent topic that we kind of always cut around in like the a lot of the Malay Muslim communities as well. Yeah. So um with that being said, right, I, I think a couple of questions that I have is also what about the men? You know, there's also going to be disobedient guys, but there's no all of these like steps and procedures for for the guys. So why why is that then an imbalance there? Like all right. Hmm. Uh, uh, the balance the imbalance is that because of the nature of of human is uh, weak and uh, but but nowadays we can see the wife also kicking the husband eh? <laughs> now the wife is not not tender anymore but the original nature of human is weak so how can that wife leave the husband's bed or or beat him or kick him or uh, do all the steps that i mentioned to the man but there is law provided for women if Okay, he uh, okay. It is us what we call uh, uh in Islam muasharah bil ma'roof. Okay, the one of the obligation of a husband is to treat the wife bil ma'roof, uh, uh, truthfully and 
uh, good ya yeah? alright if that doesn't happen okay the islamic law open the chance to the woman to go to the judge and make and and make uh, what we call that um aduan or is it um complain complain yeah and complain yeah and the judge can call the husband and if the wife would like to get out of the marriage of course the divorce is in the hand of the man but there are many rulings from that judge to terminate the marriage one is called fasakh if the husband is uh, proof that he is unjust and also did not obey the sharia and not a good muslim then or even if he is sick yeah or uh, or did not uh, did his duty to give what called nafkah yeah living for the wife all right and even did uh, something that prohibited islam like beating yeah or even psychological torture so the 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 judge can terminate the marriage we we'll call it fasakh all right and if sometimes there's no no reason yeah you just don't love that man anymore you just cannot stay with him anymore he is good nothing he did but there is another way to get out of the marriage okay maybe that man did not hurt you did not uh, do the anything to the wife but the wife just want to get out of the marriage because she might feel that she's not happy anymore there's one uh, way out that we call it hulu that the wife can pay the husband to divorce him all right so there are two ways and another one is that the judge can give warning uh, give warning uh, for a uh, marriage termination because of some act for example okay the the wife okay uh, complain to the judge that this man had beaten her then the judge may make a ruling if you beat that wife okay you must say this in front of me okay if i beat my wife once again okay the the marriage will be terminated or talak uh, jatuh uh, we call it in malay so that is also what another ruling that that judge can make to make the marriage easily terminated uh, just if uh, you have to say that if I beat her one more again in front of that judge, okay, like an oath. If I beat her once again, automatically the uh, marriage is terminated or talak uh, happen. All right. So there are many ways uh, of a woman can um, can get uh, security or can get help, yeah, to. Uh, uh, to protect herself from a bad husband yeah okay in sharia law right right okay but i think um one can make the argument that actually for women right they already start from a very marginalized background they already start with a very powerless kind of playing field if you look at the labor participation rate only like 30 percent of the country um female um a lot in middle east and a lot in north africa um uh, are governed by such policies where they see the female as like um, uh, the, 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 the housemaker or just as weak or uh, um, someone that has to be taken care of. So they already have like lesser income, they already have less education. Um, and also in, in these circumstances, even if they exist where they can, there's avenues for them to get a divorce they may just choose to stay with the husband because they have no financial security. And if they get a divorce, that could mean bankruptcy, which is why um, quite a lot of, especially um, Islamic feminists would, would, would come now of, of, of speak out against this power imbalance and say that it's, it's being very uh, unnecessarily harsh to women and is thinking of like women as someone that needs to be controlled, someone is weak, and they will bring out a lot of examples saying like, uh, if you look at like developed countries like US, like Singapore, like Malaysia, where a lot of women are now in the workforce and they, are, and they can make it for themselves, that they don't have to follow such patriarchal laws where they must listen to the men. They, they can be their own independent woman. They can go for their own jobs. They can make their own money. They are in the army. They are doing a lot of quote unquote manly jobs or, or or things that were thought of by society as, as being typically male. So what 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 do you feel about like their kind of point of view 
in regards right. to laws like this and policies. Yeah. In my opinion, uh, Muslim in Islam is very, uh, what we call that, lucky. Uh, bertua. Why? Because women will always have guardian. Will always have guardian. And this responsibility, financial responsibility, uh, security, protection, education, economy is on the shoulder of a man that is her guardian. She will always have a, a guardian until the end of her life. Okay, that is so lucky of a woman in Islam. For for example, you said that a woman, when after divorce, she might feel helpless, want to take care of her and her children. In Islam, if the okay, uh, if the uh, divorce uh, happen, so the guard the guardian's responsibility will go back to the father, the grandfather, yeah, the uncles and uh, the siblings, the the male siblings until the end of that woman's life. And the responsibility is not just on that uh, lady, but also all his ki uh, her kids and her uh, children. So how lucky she is. Okay, whether in whatever situation, she is supported. She won't be hungry. You know, the, the Islam had put the ruling that all these guardians, male guardians, must give food, must give houses, must give clothing, yeah, and must give education, uh, and sec uh, and security, yeah, to the women that under the under his guardian. All right. So for me, it is very lucky. So if you want to work, it's just like you do it as your hobby, or you just want to do it. It's not an obligatory or compulsory thing, but still, it's permitted in Islam for us to work to to be what a pilot. Also, no problem as long as you you is permitted by your guardian. All right. So it is so women can enjoy her life without have the obligatory to think to feed anybody. Yeah? To think about monetary and economy, that is actually the ideal one, lah. Mm, <laughs> but mm. when now in the what in the situation that we are living now, when men that um, have uh, less capacity in the economic uh, strife, then uh, the women have to help the men. But now I see that most of the men take granted of the lady, and happen that now man is living in the house while the woman is working. So the, the 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 thing had been turning upside down. Okay, the man that should protect a woman had now been relaxing at home while that the 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 lady is striving to work and do everything, yeah, for the children and happy if happening. So uh, the guardian thing that had been ordered in Islam had been neglected by the man, yeah, and the woman sometimes did not fight for their rights to be treated. Yeah, by the men, yeah, in the family. So I think for, for fact, this is what happened in uh, our region, South Asia. Mm. Okay, I have friends in um, Egypt, uh, where the men you know, take control, or uh, especially in the Gulf country, the what, the rich, rich country like Gulf country, Saudi Arabia, like Emirates, where where the what the Arabic. Egypt is quite a poor country, whereas the rich countries still the women did not have the obligatory or the what the the they they have less rights, but they also don't have the obligatory to to take care of them fully take care of their own financial. Everything will be given by the guardians. Okay, mm -hmm. some some might 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 look at it as less freedom, but some some might look as it as lucky. <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah, because um, like for example, you you mentioned Egypt, and I know, um, it's a very big agricultural country, so they still rely on a lot of farming. They're not very developed yet. And I know only the females constitute like five percent of of holding all the land there, whereas all the ninety five percent are all males. So when it comes down to like situations like when um they have divorce or some things like that, they would really rely on the kindness of the male providers for for them, be it their family. Or their or their ex husbands and stuff like that. Whereas um, people feel if they have um more freedom in that sense to access these lands or like to improve their uh financial well being or their educational background, that they wouldn't have to kind of rely and be 
be so um, dependent on the male providers when they can provide for themselves in that sense. So, but okay, hmm. I've been living in yeah. Egypt for 11 years. I've been living in Egypt for 11 years. I did my degree and master there. So, I can see there's quite a difference between uh, women living in the uh, town and uh, women living in the village. Okay, uh, women who are living in the town, they are just like Malaysia. I think it's just like because in Malaysia and Singapore, they are very independent and they, they work in whatever sector, they become pilot, they become uh, what army and whatever sector, sector, they are women for those who are living in town, okay? They even, um, they even uh, play a big role in politics and uh, have position in all the uh, government sectors. That is the women in town. Whereas the, the women in village, their tradition is just like what you you saw in in uh, Indian movie, you know, Bollywood movie, where they always live like in the big mansion, big family. Mm. Everybody is there, and there is one grandfather that is controlling everything. Indian culture and Egyptian culture in the village is, if you saw that Bollywood movie, then it will almost the same. So, uh, if the girl uh, got divorced or everything, they will be in the house of the father. So all the father and the men, so they won't get lost. And women also have some, okay, uh, if what we call that miros, after one uh, uh, a father die or mother die, then what we call that, the division of the, the properties, okay, women also will have their own properties. If that land is not just inherited by the son, okay, the, the, the ladies also have name in the grant of that land. So they this still have a portion they don't work but if that man work then all they will just take the uh the profit out of 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 that uh they also have like uh they don't have sour like us but they have uh they they, they what they grow wheat they grow vegetables a lot so the, the women can just sit down and get all the profits and money okay even though it's just a little bit but they can just sit down and do all the cooking and join the house but still they can get the profit out of that uh agri agricultural uh activities right so it's not that bad lah mm. I see. Okay, but and they are happy, you know, mm. <laughs> and they are happy with that. Yeah, they always say that. Hey, why are you working? Huh? yeah, we we pity you so so tired here and that we are just relaxing, singing in the house because they are leaving the ladies here, <laughs> doing all the chores together, cook together, wash together, okay, bear kids to work together, and they also did go to the field and yeah? do some agricultural work, and they are very strong. Egyptian women, they can put all heavy things on their head and just, just, <laughs> just walking like that. All right. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I can see basically where the fundamental difference lies and how your point of view sees it as a blessing for the woman to have all of these protections yeah. and stuff. Whereas others might yeah. feel it's actually going to limit them down the road, stuff like that. But okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think we 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 have another pet panel member, Don, who wants to ask you some questions about Islam as well. So, Don, if you're ready, right, Don. Yeah, hi, Doctor. Uh, my hi. questions are regarding the uh, the end times, the coming of the Messiah. All right. Uh, how do I spot the Messiah? Yeah. How you stop the Messiah? Not stop. Uh, <laughs> how do I know that that guy is the Messiah? Oh, how you know that like how, guy is Messiah? Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, the Messiah is uh, written in the what we call Torah, the Jews Torah, mm. yeah, mm. and also written in your uh, Bible, right? The coming of the Messiah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. It is. It is. Uh, it is said in the Quran that the coming of Messiah is written in the Torah and Injil. We call it Injil. Yeah. Uh, but Injil is not a um, Bible. It is declared also by the uh, the Christian in the Orthodox Christian in Egypt, churches in Egypt and Syria. Yeah. So the Injil is just the four gospels, whereas the rest they are, they didn't call them Injil. All right. So it is said that uh, in Quran it is told that uh, the coming of the Messiah is written in the Torah and Injil, and the name is Ahmad. Okay, it is written in the Quran. Yeah, we read this uh, this verse every uh, Friday during our subuh prayer. 
Okay, surah uh, As-Sajjadah. Surah As-Sajjadah, it is uh, written there in that surah that uh, it is written in Injil and Torah, the coming of Messiah named Ahmad. Okay, all right. Uh, but, okay, uh, in the Torah that is existing now and also the Bible that is existing now, there are just uh, statements about Messiah without uh, writing the name of that Messiah. Yeah, uh, no names, right? Okay, so in the Islamic perspective, the Messiah is our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Messiah that should be believed by the Jews and also the Christian is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That is considered the last prophet. Okay, the end of revelation. Okay, before the end of the world or the kiyama uh, or the what, Armageddon or okay the the what the destruction of of uh, earthly uh, beings and moving to the next life that is called hereafter. We call this destruction as Qiyamah. All right. So in the Islamic perspective, the Messiah is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Prophet Muhammad. Okay, whereas, okay, in uh, uh, when, okay, the Christians during the day of uh, Muhammad, when the Muhammad came, okay, you know, all the, the Jews that was supposedly be in Jerusalem and they actually had been scattered uh, in many places, they also came, okay, because of the prophecy, they came to uh, Mecca and Medina because of the prophecy that the Messiah will be coming in that region and also the uh, Christians, yeah, Christians, priests, okay, uncle of uh, Prophet Muhammad's wife, Khadijah, her, her uncle is uh, a Christian priest, also is waiting for that Messiah in the, uh, that religion because of the prophecy of the priest. Okay, suddenly when Muhammad Wasallam came by and announced that I am Muhammad, that is pronounced in your book as Messiah and I am the last messenger, okay, some of the Christians believe some of the Jews believe those those people we call them in Quran as Ahlul Kitab. Ahlul Kitab means the Jews and the Christians who are still Jews and still Christian, but they believe that Muhammad is the Messiah. But many many of the other Jews, especially the non priests, most of the priests believe the non priests and half of the priests did not believe that Muhammad is the Messiah and still waiting for Messiah until now. So now, of course, the Jews are still betting who is the Messiah and the Christians are also waiting for the Messiah, but not as Muslim. Okay, in, Muslim, the, uh, in the belief of us, Muslim, there, uh, the, uh, what we are waiting now is just the, the end of this world, the destruction, and before that, they will come, uh, not a Messiah, but Antichrist, that you call Antichrist, we call it Dajjal. They will be coming as the last sign uh, as the last sign of the destruction of the, this world. Okay, and then Prophet Isa alayhi salam that you call Jesus, we call the Isa that is not dead, you know, because during the uh, resurrection and during the uh, what crucifixion, okay, our Quran told us that Isa is not dead, but it, he is taken, yeah, to the, we call, we don't call it uh, heaven, we call it, uh, uh, what? Uh, langit. Langit apa? Sky. <laughs> because what the sky, we believe that there are many skies, seven, seven, seven grades of sky. This is a holy sky. Then there are many, many, many uh, grades of sky until uh, the Sidratul Muntaha, the, the, the place where uh, the angels uh, reside and the throne of God is there. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Isa is there and Prophet Muhammad had seen him during the, what we call Isra and Mi'raj, when the Prophet Muhammad had been taken to the uh, throne of God, yeah, he met uh, even uh, Prophet Isa or Jesus in those skies. There are many, every skies have uh, every prophet there. All right, so this uh, uh, Isa alayhi salam, okay, we believe that Prophet Isa or Jesus will, is the one it is stated in the Quran that Isa is the one who will come down again and he is the one who is going to kill Antichrist or uh, Dajjal. And after that, okay, 
after that uh, will be the end of the world. That is the last sign, okay, uh, of the end of the world. And after that, uh, the Antichrist had been killed by Isa Ali Salam, okay, everybody will die, yeah, and then the sun will be rise in the west as the last sign. And after that, after that, okay, uh, the world will hurt a strong trumpet blow. Okay, we don't know what that kind of trumpet, but it's a trumpet. It's called trumpet blow, uh, a, a very loud one, and every everybody will be dead in this uh, uh, world, and also the destruction will happen. Everybody will be dead because of the destruction of the universe will happen. It's not just this earth; everything, the universe, will be destroyed. Okay, so that is what Muslim believe. So Muslim did not. Is not going to wait for any Messiah again, uh, right? So that is our is is the perspective of Muslim about Messiah. So maybe in your religion, in Christian, you are still waiting for Messiah. So of course, in Islam, we don't have all the characteristic. Yeah, you might have prophecies in your teaching. Your your what your your priest might be teaching you about all these prophecies. But in Islam, we don't. We are not going to wait for. A messiah is just the destruction of the world. That's all. Okay, is it clear? That this yes, is a clear, mystery. doctor. Okay. Uh, now my next question is: You said how Jesus will come, Isa will come during the end times to defeat Dajjal. Mm -hmm. uh, now my question is: How would you identify Isa or Jesus? Like, what are the characteristics of uh, this? This, this Jesus. Person? How can mm. you know that it's Jesus? So it is mm. told uh, in a long uh, hadith or prophet, prophet, prophet tradition that uh, when that Dajjal came, okay, at the same time, there will be a man and he is from the uh, descendants of uh, Prophet Muhammad, meaning that uh, what the uh, the great 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 grandchildren from the what the line of Muhammad mm -hmm. and he is his name is Muhammad bin Abdullah, yeah. just the same name as Nabi Muhammad and uh, uh, his family name is Al Mahdi, so this Al Mahdi is the one who will unite uh, Muslim yeah uh, uh, to fight the Jews actually before the Antichrist come there will be a fight between Muslim and Jews. Okay, great fight between Muslim and Jews or the non-believers, we call it non-Muslim. All right, and this uh, Muhammad bin Abdullah will be the leader of the troops. Okay, the the what the army that that will be fighting with Jews. So this is this is something that is going to happen before the Antichrist coming. Okay, so a big war between Muslim and Jews or Muslim the non-Muslim will happen and will be led by. Uh, Muhammad bin Abdullah Al Mahdi, okay, and uh, the central of the uh, war, okay, will be uh, at the Jerusalem now, Baitul Maqdis now. So after uh, uh, Muhammad Al Mahdi won that war, and united all the human being and make every human being. Uh, uh, living in peace, okay, then the Antichrist will come and make another havoc, okay. Then, when, okay, the sign is like this when uh, Muhammad al Mahdi be the Imam at Baitul Maqdis, then Jesus will be one of who is praying behind Muhammad al Mahdi. That is the sign, okay. Then and people would don't know that he is Jesus until okay. the Dajjal is killed. The one who killed the Dajjal, then only people know that that is Isa Okay, because mm -hmm. when Jesus come uh, again, he will announce himself as the uh, followers of Muhammad, followers and uh, following all the Muhammadian law. All right, so he will be praying behind Muhammad Al Mahdi. Yeah, at that time, all right, and only uh, all the Muslim and everybody will only know that he is Jesus when he managed to kill Antichrist. Then only know, okay, Jesus. Then after that, yeah, okay, after that, the what? Uh, the the destruction will begin and Muslim will be die. Uh, the Muslim will be dead before the destruction. All Muslim will be dead. 
Okay, it is told that during the destruction of the earth, not even a single Muslim is alive. Okay, so, mm -hmm. so how to know that is Jesus? Only when the Antichrist is killed. Okay, so the killer, the one who can kill the Antichrist, now all even the Muslim will know, ah, oh, that is Prophet Isa alayhi salam. Before that, they, don't, they won't know because when Jesus came, he will be just like a human being praying behind, always praying behind Muhammad bin Abdullah al-Mahdi in Jerusalem. By in Jerusalem, understood. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, my next question is about Sufism. All right. Um, now, Sufism is a branch of Islam, mm -hmm. but it explores, it's, if I'm not wrong, it's more of a direct experience of God. Mm-hmm. Whereas Islam is a religion where you experience God after death. Am I right to say this? All right. Okay. Actually, the term of the term Sufism did not exist in uh, while Muhammad uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet, is still alive. The word mm -hmm. the Sufism, the word Sufi itself, did not exist during his days. Right. All right, the word that is used to describe Sufism is in one of his hadiths. Okay, when Gabriel come, okay, and meet him, okay, Gabriel ask him, but what is Islam? Yeah, and then he, uh, Muhammad tell about uh, uh, what is Iman first, what is Iman or belief, what is belief? Okay, then Jibril, uh, Muhammad said that the one who asked know better. Then Jibril said that Iman is all the six pillars that I mentioned before. Then Jibril asked him, what is Islam? So again, Prophet Muhammad said, the one who asked know better. So Jibril said that Islam is all these five pillars that I mentioned about, about the worship, the, the worship law. All right, then Jibril asked uh, Prophet Muhammad, what is Ihsan? And again, um, Prophet Muhammad said that the, the one who asked knows better. Then Jibril de defined Ihsan as uh, in Arabic, Antabudallahi ka annakatarahu means that when you are worshipping God, you must worship as if you see him. If you cannot feel that you are seeing him, you must believe and feel that he is looking at, can see you. Looking at and can see you. All right. So this Ihsan is considered a Sauf or Sufi in Islam. Meaning that feeling, the existence of God, is just the feeling. You cannot see him in the eyes because Allah described himself as Laysa kemislihi shaykh. God said that he is cannot be imagined. He's not anything that you can imagine. You can see with uh, your senses, or even you cannot imagine with your brain and, and you in or in your dreams. Yeah. So whatever comes to your sense or dreams or thinking that is not God. So you cannot see him, but you can feel the existence of that God. And Allah says that what is the um, what, uh, how that you, okay, uh, know that I am exist. Look at my um, ayah. Ayah means tanda tanda. What is tanda tanda in English? Signs. Uh, uh, look at the signs. Okay, look at the signs in universe. How the universe is created. How special. How they are so systematic. And when you ask me, then you will be. Uh, responded. So these are the signs that I am exist. So you cannot see me, but you can feel the sign. All right. So during worship, okay, in a Sufis tradition, during worship, when you are worshiping, when you are praying, when you are uh, doa or praying, or when you are fasting, when you are doing good, you, are, you always feel that Allah, you as if you can see. Because uh, when we are doing good, we always have to do what we call ikhlas. Ikhlas is not just mere sincerity. Ikhlas means to do whatever because of Allah, because of God. So when we pray, it's because of you, Allah. When we do good, it's because of you, Allah. Everything is because of you. We get married because of you. We give birth is because of you. We obey our husband is because of you. It's not because of husband. Okay, we work hard is because of you. Everything is because of Allah. When everything is because of Allah, you feel that 
that Allah is so near. And especially when you are in hardship, when you uh, what uh, uh, prostrating, yeah, sujud, yeah, you will, uh, Allah said that I am near to you during your prostration. When you are prostrating, I am nearer to you Uh, nearer than your own uh, what we call urat nadi here eh? your your vein your vein eh? what we call that artery or, or vena yeah or vein all right so we can feel it okay and sometimes that uh, we always feel that we are being Allah is looking at us Allah is there okay sometimes what we call you can because in that uh, particular hadith or tradition prophet tradition is said that as if you can see him so the very pious people or the sufis they always you know as if allah is there you cannot see whatever it's not but it's just the feeling so that is uh, about sufism of course i know um, uh, what in christianity you doing meditation and to feel the existence of holy spirit and the existence of god yeah okay uh, but in islam it is about the feel and sometimes when i share with the priest and even even with the buddhist uh, monk okay the the feeling is almost the same you know uh, the, the, the what the experience that is what we call the mystical experience right uh, okay Is it, uh, yes. is it uh, yeah. clear? Yeah. Yeah, it's clear. Uh, my last question will be about uh, an angel. His name is uh, Iblis. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you tell me more about uh, him? Iblis? Okay. Yeah. Iblis in a uh, Christian tradition is, uh, what? The name, uh, his name is, what, uh, what is his uh, name? Lucifer. Again? Lucifer, okay, okay. In Christian tradition, Lucifer is uh, a, an angel that had been uh, what punished by God, right? And sent to the right. worldly life, right? But in mm-hmm. Islamic tradition, Iblis is not an angel. <laughs> in the Quran, it, it is stated really clearly that Iblis wakana min al jin. He is one of the genie. Okay, in Islamic belief, okay, the beings that have been mentioned in God, other than uh, all these universe, okay, animals, uh, plants, okay, the living beings are human, and there is another creature called jinn, the genie, okay, the uh, and also the angels. These are living creatures, all right. Of course, animals and then plants, all right. So, uh, human are made from um, what we call uh, tanah, soil, okay, and angels are made from uh, light, and these genies are made from fire, all right, okay. So, uh, Iblis is part of this genie uh, that is so pious. So, that's why the Muslim, the Islamic law, It's not uh, a law just for human being, but it's also also the law for the jinns. That's why there is a uh, one a chapter in Quran or surah in Quran. The, the name is Surah Jin. Okay, the jin heard the recitation of Quran from Prophet Muhammad, and they want come and see Prophet Muhammad, and Allah let Prophet Muhammad see them. So actually, uh, if you learn about quantum physics or whatever, so these genes is actually living just at the same um, same uh, space of the human being, but in a uh, in a different what we call quantum in a different uh, same space but different different dimension. Realm. Dimension, yeah. So actually, maybe that jinn is here with me. That jinn is here. <laughs> okay, but it's prescribed in the hadith that jinn's house, jinn's always like to live in somewhere that human being is not. Okay, so the the segregation is always there. So you might accidentally meet him, meet them if you go to somewhere that uh their home. Yeah, <laughs> right. Okay, so this uh iblis is actually one of the jinn's and not the angels. All right, so there are a lot of genes. So these genes existed before the human being is created. Adam is created. So when Adam is created, then Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala asks all the creatures to bow or pro- uh, prostrate to uh, Adam. Is not like uh, is not to worship Adam, but to show um, what uh, hormat to show respect to Adam. So this gene 
a name as Iblis. So all these Jim just uh, have names like us. I am a human being named Norazina and Jinns have a lot of names and one of them is Iblis. So this Iblis was actually the pious, the 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 one who had worshipped the, the worship the god the most until the angels also admire him so this particular gene named iblis kissed stood up and said i don't want to prostrate to adam uh, why the god asked him and said, because i am made of fire and he is made by the soil soil okay uh, so fire in terms of fire and soil fire is seen as better all right so Allah said that uh, uh, why you should respect him because I gave him, uh, I teach him names or we call that knowledge. Uh, a lot of knowledge I've given to him, making him better than you. So the Iblis, uh, Abba, don't want to prostrate and um, don't want to obey God's, uh, what, uh, Allah's, uh, 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 what we call that, order. And then Allah said, okay, if you don't want to follow my order, okay, I will put you in the hell. So the meaning that the heaven and hell had been existent since then. So then Iblis pled uh, God. All right, but before you put me in hell, okay, please give me another chance. That is, I will take, <laughs> I will make uh, some of Adam's... Uh, child, children, uh, great, great children, uh, I will make them follow me. It's like a challenge to the God. Because the, the God said that this creature is very smart. I give them uh, what uh, brain and give them, I taught Adam so many things that he can taught his children. Uh, okay, they are smarter than you. Okay, in terms of smart, not in terms of the worship, worship, worshipness. Iblis was a good worshipper. But Adam is good in terms of intelligence. So he said, oh, it's a challenge because you said that this uh, creature is so intelligent. Give me a chance and I will make this intelligent creature follow me to the hell. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him that. Okay, okay. So that is what happened. Okay, so both of you, I will put both of you, uh, not before that. <laughs> okay, the first thing that Iblis did is to make Adam punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that I'll say, okay, I will send both to both of you out of uh, the heaven and put both of you in the universe, worldly universe. Okay, and then, okay, I give you the chance, Iblis, to prove that you can, uh, you can, uh, hasud, what we call that? You can, what is hasud? Influence. Influence all these Adam's children to follow you. And then those who are follow you will go to you to the hell. Okay. And those who do not follow you will go to the heaven. And Allah said in the Quran, everybody will could be uh, uh, what? Uh, influenced by the Iblis unless for those who are mukhlisin. Ikhlas means who have purely and sincerity towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why uh, when we are uh, preaching and teaching the Muslim, the, the, the very, very important thing is to be pure towards Allah. Okay? Be sincere and pure towards Allah because that is the only way to safeguard yourself from the influence from the Iblis. And Iblis, Adam has his own uh, what, uh, children and Iblis also have his own children among jinn. Uh, so the jinn is divided into Muslim jinns, jinns who uh, are Muslim and not uh, bad. They will go to the uh, heaven with the human being, the good human being and the followers of Iblis okay, who are uh, what? Uh, who did not obey the teaching of Islam or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the followers of Iblis. They will, they will be the one who, who is helping Iblis to influence the uh, Adam's children. Right. So that is the, uh, so the concept of Iblis in Islam is not uh, like what is uh, belief in Christianity because Christianity believed that Lucifer was an angel that had been punished by God. So Iblis is not is not a creature, it's not an angel, it's another creature. Okay. And it's not because of uh, the punishment, it's not because of uh, uh his uh, because just because he disobeyed, 
uh, Allah to respect uh, the Adam and uh, Adam alaihi salam. Is it clear the differences? Yes, it's clear. Yeah, it's clear. Um, my last question will be about Adam and Eve. Uh, in in Christianity, they eat uh, Eve was Eve uh, ate an apple, so mm-hmm. because of that, uh, she got kicked out of the garden. Do do Muslims have uh, the same belief? Sorry, I can hear you. Sorry. Hello, Hello Yune. Sorry, I can hear you. Hey Don, are you there still? All right, in here. Okay, so yeah, I, I think we okay. Don. I think we may have lost Don. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. So okay, in any case, so maybe uh, I think what Don wanted to ask was about yeah. So uh, do Muslims have the same belief as Christians do that you All know right. uh, Eve was kicked out because of she uh, she ate and, uh, some forbidden right. fruit. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, in our Quran, it is uh, it has the all, the whole verses and stories about what happened to Adam and Eve in the heaven. Okay, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created Adam, and then uh, and living in heaven. And uh, one day, uh, Adam said to God that I am so lonely. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created uh, Eve from one of his ribs okay adam is made of soul and eve is made from the ribs of adam uh, okay and that is called hawa your eve is hawa in uh, the quran in in arabic is he's called hawa all right so uh, both uh, adam and Eve or Adam and Hawa uh, live in uh, the heaven and also Ta'ala said to them, now I've created to you Hawa, okay, live happily in this heaven, okay, you can uh, eat anything, you can do anything except for please do not eat this plant, okay, it's not uh, said in the Quran as an apple, it is a shajara, the, the words mean shajara, okay, um, okay, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say anything about that plant, whether it is an eternal plant or whatever plant. Uh, in the Quran, Allah just said, please do not eat this kind of plant. Okay. All right. And then it comes that uh, Iblis, yeah, come try to influence uh, Hawa and influence Adam alayhi salam and said that if you eat this plant, yeah, you will be... Uh, you are not going to die. You will be eternal. You are going to be uh, immortal, right? Uh, mortal or immortal? <laughs> mortal is dead. Immortal. Immortal is not. Uh, not is not going to die. So uh, they are excited about that, and they forgot. Yeah, Allah said they forgot. Yeah, about what Allah had said because of the excitedness. So they ate that uh, plant and uh, that. After they ate that plant, okay, the aura, okay, before that they cannot see the what they are aura, okay, uh, they can see aura means the the body that should not be seen by a woman or man cannot see some parts of man, then it is revealed because of eating of that plant, okay, and then they pick up all the leaves that uh, existed in uh, the heaven and covered themselves. Then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said. Okay, because you did do this, I will punish you, all right, and send you to the earth. Okay, you will live there, yeah, fighting each other. <laughs> you and your you your daughters and your what uh children will live there and fighting each other. Yeah, battle, okay, all right. So and iblis also will go there with you, okay, and will influence you in that because we have to strive living in the earth, yeah, to come back to heaven. Okay, teach your children to uh, come back to heaven later. All right, so, uh, uh, but then Allah said that, uh, and then uh, uh, Adam and Eve, they repented. Okay, they seek for forgiveness uh, from Allah. Okay, we repent and Allah said, I have forgiven you. Uh, right, so, but still, okay, I will put you in the earth. All right, so that's why from that story, okay, the difference thing about what the belief of Christianity and Islam is that Christianity believed that all uh, Adam and Eve was put into the earth as punishment, and Allah uh, or the God, uh, the Father, did not forgive Adam. But in Islam, 
uh, Adam had been forgiven and it's just like Allah uh, Allah's plan just to put it's actually the plan you know Allah created heaven and hell want to test the human being yeah? so the, the incident is just to happen for, for Muslim we believe that Adam ate that uh, plant okay uh, to show that that is the weakness of a human being and human being have uh, other than the intelligence or aql or brain or mind, okay, that is the proof that uh, human being also have uh, this, uh, this what the component in himself that is called nafs or shahwa, or we call it what uh, the drive uh, to 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 uh, move you to do some. Uh, not rational things. Uh, okay, that's why in in uh, Arabic that drive is called Hawa because Hawa started all uh, the what influenced the Iblis influence Hawa and for Hawa influence Adam. So that drive is called also Hawa, but not just Hawa. It's called Shahwa. All right, the drive that that is not in line with your mind, your thinking. So it is just for us Muslim. We know that. Incident happen is just as indication to tell us that human have this drive. You have the intelligent drive. You have the one that always asks you to do what is not logical and contradict with your uh, brain and mind. All right. So uh, and we don't believe that we have the um, we don't inherit any sins from Adam. Because Adam is forgiven, it's stated clearly in the Quran. Okay, Adam seek for repentance and he repented, and I forgave him. He said that oh, he is forgiven by God. Okay, anyway, and then he said, I uh, they are forgiven, and anyway, I will put you both uh, in the earth. All right, to the earth, earth. Right. So this is the main point, the difference between Islam and Christianity, whereby Muslim did not believe that Adam's sin is inherited uh, to his children, whereas Christianity believed that the Adam's sin is inherited. And there is verse in the Quran that said clearly, La taziru wa ziratun wizra ukhra. Nobody will inherit anybody's sin. Not just Adam's sins, anybody's sins. The daughter will not inherit the father's sin. The mother will not inherit the daughter's or the son's sin. Okay, the teacher's sin. Who's ever sin, they have to be uh, responsible for their own deeds and sins. Nobody will inherit anything, all right? Okay, so that is uh, what uh, Muslim belief and what is stated in the Quran about the, the incident of Adam and Eve in the uh, heaven. All right, thank you, Doctor. Huh? Yes, right. very clear. Okay. Uh, now, pass back to Yunir. Yunir, please. All right, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Doctor. So we've spent, uh, I think, more than uh, an hour and a half, I think, or maybe about there. Right, so thank you so much uh, for your time. Uh, I, I think maybe I can just ask you one more question. So because we, right. we've talked about... Let me just kind of uh, sum up what we have uh, discussed. We have talked about what you shared, right? Mm -hmm. And before I ask my last question, uh, so we first talked about uh, you know the the start of you know, the basic what is Islam, who is considered Muslim, mm -hmm. right? And uh, from from that question, I, I you know you shared with us that what's fundamental is the belief, right? And the announcement, and then I also shared that you know it's it's. Uh, sometimes when we talk about or when we hear about Islam, it's not about the belief; it's actually about the the actions yeah. and the laws, right? Yeah, right. So that was that's the focus. So that's a misconception that people may have. Then and then we you you shared with us the Sharia laws, what it, what they are, uh, and we focused a bit on women's issues, particularly in uh, in the family and the marriage, right? So again, we heard some uh, against it, some popular ideas, some popular beliefs or uh, misconceptions, all right? And then we moved on to talk about the end times again. You address some of the perceptions that we may have, right? Uh, the, the the idea that you no know, in Islam there's no idea, we, we don't believe in the Messiah, right? Yeah, and then you talked about how uh, in Islam we also don't have the idea of the fallen in uh, sorry, yeah uh, we are, we don't have the original sin, 
right? Yeah, so unlike yeah. Christianity. But nonetheless, these misconceptions uh, do persist, right? They, they exist, they are widespread. So, and even among Muslims, right? So on that note, right? Uh, my, and here's my last question, I guess. So if we were to equip ourselves with a bit more knowledge, or if we want to really uh, understand a bit more on, on, on Islam, uh, what would you recommend us to do? Is there any authority authority that you you know would recommend us? Yeah, or a particular book that you would recommend us, or, or what do we do? If let's say we do have you know, these things that we uh, want answers to, or what should we avoid maybe? All right. Yeah. Okay. The first and foremost, okay. The first thing, um, uh, why we believe in Islam is because we believe in the revelation. We don't know Prophet Muhammad. We don't see him. Okay, we heard from our uh, uh, parents about Islam. We, uh, for example, I am born in Muslim Muslim uh, family and was taught about Islam, doctrinized in Islam, and taught in schools. And then, of course, when we come to our puberty, means we have all this uh, ability of thinking, and we, of course, we want to know what Islam is. Actually, it's not just by following our uh, parents or what had been. Uh, just uh, we just absorb what had been taught. We might have some critical thinking, right? Because uh, develop uh, uh, what after our puberty age, then the first and foremost thing is you want you have to go to find the truth. Okay, okay, and in uh, to to know whether Islam is the truth or not is from the revelation. The first one Allah challenge in the Quran. Okay, look at these verses. This is my words and these are my verses. Okay, please find is anything wrong with my verses. And if you cannot reconnect uh, to yourself about my verses, okay, then everything about Islam is in, the, in that verses. So the first and foremost thing to do is to read the Quran. All right, to, uh, to read the Quran. And our Quran is not like a book that you need to to have some we don't have priests in in islam you you don't have to go to ulama and ustad to interpret interpret them for you many many of the verses are very straightforward yeah okay only a few verses that use a very um uh, some uh, arabic if you read arabic uh, arabic words that might might have some we call it we have to need some interpretation using Arabic interpretations yeah, but most of the verses whether you read them in Arabic or you read the translation they are very direct yeah and from that verses you can find the truth of Islam don't look elsewhere yet okay look and everything what that I told you is in the verse yeah in in front of your eyes then after that if you believe that verse that is from God, then you go to the second source of Islam that is the prophet tradition or hadith. Not so many. Yeah, the Sahih hadith is just like uh, 4,000 of hadith in Sahih Bukhari. Okay, they are the interpretation of the Quran, actually, and the, the way of life, how to, how to, all the things that have been ordered in the Quran and how to practice them uh, in life is uh, interpreted by uh, Prophet Muhammad that showing how to do it uh, practically in life, it is in the hadith. So these two sources, if you go through them and you read them, nobody can, can cheat you. Yeah? <laughs> Whatever tradition you live, okay? You can just take this Quran if you don't, you, you don't agree with Father, take this verse and see what Allah says. Go to the judge and see what Allah says. Because judgment and uh, rules in, in Islam is... Uh, build up from those verses, all right, and that are absolute um, source of Islam and rulings and laws and belief and whatever, all right. So that is the 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 first and foremost thing to do. That's why we can see a lot of non-Muslims, Christian Christian priests, when they read the Quran. Sometimes the Christian priests read the Quran and not the Muslim. <laughs> they are Muslim, but they don't know. They are. The, uh, what, the words of their God and the source of their religion. But that's why we, we found that many, many, many people who wrote, who read the Quran, they will instantly become Muslim. Just after one reading, then they try to read it again and again and find the sources and explanation. The truth is, that because that's why it's called, a Quran is called miracle. It's the words of God. Yeah? Everything is about yourself is told there. Uh, it is the interpretation about universe. 
why you are a human, who you are, what you should do here, and what will happen to you later after you die, and what will happen to this universe. Everything is clear cut told in that Quran. What should I live? What should I eat? What should I wear? How the marriage should be done? Who is girl? Who is boy? How to everything about life is told completely in the Quran, then that is considered a miracle. So for every Muslim, please hold that. Even the Prophet says before he died in his last sermons, okay, please hold these two sources, the Quran and my traditions, the Hadith. You won't be lost forever. Okay, and I would like to convey the same thing that had been conveyed by the Prophet 1,400 years ago in his last sermon. Please hold and read these two sources. Everything, not just a few verses, everything that you won't be lost in this world. Okay, Yunir, I think that is my uh, advice. Okay, thank Yunir? you so much. Uh, yeah, hi. Okay, right. thank you so much, Doctor, once again uh, for your time. Uh, you, uh, Sim, any Don, any last questions or comments? No, I think you uh, no, were doctor. amazing, Doctor. You're very knowledgeable yeah. and you made the podcast quite interesting to listen to. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. All right. So yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. So again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we are really privileged. Uh, you've answered our questions. Uh. And definitely, we 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 do have plenty of other questions. I think we we may want to ask. Uh, maybe perhaps we may invite you again, and hopefully you would uh, be able to accept our invitation again. All right. So in any case, all right. So, but for today's session, I uh, I believe we can we have come to a to an end. All right. So thank you so much again for joining us. You're right. welcome. Right. And thank you, Sim, for initiate all these things. <laughs> you are the initiator, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Thank you. All right. Welcome. Okay. okay, that's all, Doctor. Thank you so much. Welcome. See you all. Take care, everybody.